and by default, everybody uh, uh, should be muted, except for you and I. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, there we go. We got some people. Um, All right, so this is the this is the initial attempt to uh, to hold a, a major Zoom meeting on my part. So uh, we're just going to see how it goes, and hopefully we don't get Zoom bombed. I'm finding that that's a um, a new term now these days. So hopefully we we did the permissions correctly, and and uh, we can move on without uh, without a lot of headaches. But uh, um, I will continue to allow people in um, as we go through here. Uh, I'll ask that um, everybody on the meeting, um, you should have down at the bottom of your screen, uh, it says chat. If you open that chat box, if you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat and I will compile them and we'll address those questions at the end of uh, Dr. Beam's uh, uh, presentation. Um, uh, as a, uh, um, as a rule, everybody that comes in has their microphone uh, muted and it's, you can unmute it um, by clicking the uh, uh, microphone icon. And most people's video is not um, active. Uh, if you would like to deactivate that or, or activate your video, then you can do so by clicking the, um, the video icon. Uh, it really depends on your bandwidth. So I've seen, uh, I've seen people that try to get a little more out of their bandwidth and it just kind of crashes for them. So if somebody needs to leave and get back in, I'll let you in. Uh, if somebody uh, uh, crashes out, then uh, try to try to re-up again and uh, uh, get back in the room and I'll let you back in the room. But uh, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, first thing I'd like uh, everyone to do is go ahead and everybody type their names. If you're watching with somebody else, everybody type their names in the, um, in the chat, just so I can kind of have a record there of, uh, of, of who's on that way I can submit that. We don't, I can't give you a sign in sheet. Uh, so I want you, I want everybody to type your name into the, uh, into the chat for us. While you're doing that, I'll, uh, I'll share uh, today. We have, uh, we have Dr. Marley Beam with us. He's our Associate Extension Specialist in Aquaculture. Um, he's, uh, he's been, been active for, for quite some time in, uh, um, in the pond management and aquaculture type uh, settings. So, uh, he's a really good resource for us to have. He has a lot of publications on pods um, or our, uh, our DocuShare where we house our fact sheets. And the, the, uh, the photo here is a little misleading because uh, um, 
what you see here is is clean shape <laughs> so no. um, but uh, um, so if uh, we have uh, okay looks like we're starting out with everybody in the room so I'll uh, turn this over to uh, to Dr. Bean and um, let him go through his information. Like I said, if you have questions, please type them in the chat and I will compile those and address those um, at the uh, end of the at the end of the uh, presentation. I am recording this so that we can view it uh, later as well. So. Uh, Dr. Beam, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm here for uh, emotional support. Great, great. Thank you very much, Brandon. I appreciate all your efforts, and I appreciate everybody uh, joining us today. Uh, I've done more than a few presentations on pond management. This is the first time to do it in the Zoom format, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to trying it in this way. But I, I assume that it, just as all the other presentations, most of you are here because you have a problem with your pond. So I realize that uh, that may be one of your big motivators, uh, some issue in, with the pond. So that's why the questions are especially important and we want to, uh, one way or another, make time for that. We'll have about 30 or so slides to go through if the technology allows me to, to do that. We'll give this a shot and see what happens here. And um, let's see. We're getting there slowly but surely. All right, I think everybody should see my first slide by now. So we will uh, go through what I would consider to be the highlights of uh, uh, things that maybe you, maybe things you are already thinking about, but maybe some things you have not yet thought about. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different dimensions to managing a pond and to enjoying a pond. People have different objectives. I realize that some people may be here because they're primarily interested in ponds as a resource for watering livestock. Uh, some people may be here because they have a pond with an appearance issue uh, that's very important to their to their property. They enjoy the looks of the pond, but it may not be looking like they wish it did. Uh, some people may be here because they are anglers. And some of you may even be here because of all three of those things, but those are generally the top three things that we get into. Plants are the number one concern that people tend to have, at least when they contact me or the extension office. They're worried that uh, something has gotten out of hand and uh, sometimes we forget some basic facts about pond plants. The first is that they are entirely natural. Um, when you build a pond, it's kind of analogous to having some bare soil. Uh, if you go out and you clear a piece of land off, it's normal for plants to grow back and it's just nature's way of filling up a vacuum. So uh, to aim to have a pond that has no plants in it is going to be an unnatural situation. And, uh, just as with this bare land, we'd want something there to keep it from blowing away or washing away. Well, there are similar advantages to allowing some plants. And in fact, you're going to have to work really hard to not have plants in a pond. <sighs> but then we get into the issue of what is, uh, what is good, uh, especially when it comes to aesthetics and fishing and that sort of thing, and perhaps some other concerns with uh, livestock but uh, I, I look at a pond like this and it, everybody's, everybody has a different impression of this situation. Uh, they are uh, perhaps looking at that uh, band of plants around the edge as being an eyesore. I, I don't see it that way, but it's all up to, to you. You're the pond owner. You are the one who is in the driver's seat to decide what is or is not uh, what you want. But uh, to me, something, a pond that has about 20% coverage uh, is advantageous. Uh, that's what the fish are looking for, if fishing is at all important to you. And uh, there are other advantages we'll get into. But again, it's entirely up to, to you and what you want. Uh, uh, in a situation like this one, for instance, if, 
if the, the complaint was, I just can't cast from shore anymore without getting my hook fouled, uh, there are some strategies that we could suggest that might involve spot treatments with herbicides periodically on a few sections of the shoreline to open that up for fishing. One of the advantages uh, that we don't uh, think about maybe, or maybe most pond owners are not considering, is uh, if, if, again, if fishing is important to you, uh, the plants are very much associated with the production of insects. Uh, like the, the dragonfly nymph in the upper right and, uh, and uh, the damselfly nymph down there. Uh, those are prime fish food, very important for the smaller fish. So we depend on submerged plants to, uh, to be the place for uh, producing that fish food. Submerged weed beds are also important for protecting uh, the, the prey populations from predatory fish, from our bass. So those refuges are, uh, that they create, uh, those submerged weed beds are, are advantageous for that purpose. They also uh, help with, uh, in windswept pond situations, uh, they help the, the marginal plants, the emergent plants are very important in preventing shoreline erosion, sometimes dam erosion. If, you're, if your wind is such that it's blowing towards your dam, uh, you may get erosion of the dam if you, were not to have emergent aquatic plants. So uh, I hope I'm doing a halfway decent job of convincing you that uh, there are a little bit of advantages. You may be uh, uh, overwhelmed by a plant problem at the moment and wish you could just make them all go away, but there are problems with that. When we do have a problem with excess aquatic plant growth, Step one is going to be identifying the plant so that we know uh, what it is because there is, uh, especially uh, usually we're talking about an herbicide application of some sort and we have to match your plant to the proper herbicide and that's a little bit of a complicated deal. It, it, it's just impossible if we don't know what the plant is. Now, if you tell me you've got cattails, I will believe you and your county extension office will believe you because I've never seen a misidentification of cattails. But from there on out, it's very easy to misidentify things. So we want to be specific about uh, getting this right so we don't waste uh, time or money or, or even cause harm by treating for the wrong plant with something that's not effective. So how do we do that? I think uh, it, it begins with a good close-up photo. Here is a, an example of my recommendation on what would be needed in, way, uh, in the way of a photo that uh, your county extension office uh, would be able to identify the plant. We want a single plant or at least in each plant picked out from each other and lay them out nicely on some, a, a light background and then uh, take your photo from about 12 inches away. Uh, hopefully having a picture of what the picture should look like will help you because oftentimes I get something or we get something that looks like this. Um, we may or may not be able to identify just a pile of, of uh, plants that have been uh, dredged out of the pond. And oftentimes we also get this, a distant photo. We may or may not be able to identify the plant by just uh, taken by somebody who's just standing on the shoreline and, and, and snapping a picture. So uh, that example is one I would uh, hope would stick with you. A, a close up from about 12 inches away of a single plant on a light background would be just about perfect for our purposes. What can we say about the different categories of plants? Uh, one of the problems we might run into with pond plant growth would be floating plants. Uh, there are some floating plants that uh, if the conditions are right, they'll just cover your entire pond. Uh, here we see a combination of duckweed and the smaller plant being water meal. Uh, you never want to have your entire pond blanketed by this. Uh, that's going to prevent sunlight from getting down into the water column and without sunlight for the submerged plants, you're not going to have any oxygen and your fish are going to be uh, you're going to have an experience of fish kill. So try not to let floating plants ever take over the pond entirely. Lots of different submerged plants. Uh, here's uh, my sample submerged plant uh, picture of coontail, a uh, nice plant that 
sometimes as a weed, but more often than not, it's just uh, uh, doesn't cause problems for people at all and has all those benefits of uh, food production and uh, uh, in the form of insects. Uh, so coontail is uh, generally a good plant, but sometimes it might be a bad plant in some people's ponds if it becomes overabundant. Without uh, emergent plants on the edge of a pond uh, or some submerged weed beds a little bit further out, uh, you typically get some shoreline erosion like we're seeing here. Doesn't look especially bad here, but those, uh, that, that terrestri those terrestrial grasses are not going to prevent shorelines from eroding in the face of wind action. So uh, if we got over aggressive and got rid of this, we might see this, and then we might also see some muddiness in the pond as uh, the, those waves uh, kicked up some soil off the, the bottom of the, uh, the edge. Here is a, uh, a plant that uh, sometimes uh, I suspect, or maybe more often than not, has been transplanted deliberately. Uh, it's often uh, misnamed uh, as lilies, but these, this is American lotus, very similar, uh, but it is a different species. Uh, uh, people have a lot of uh, bad feelings about lilies, but it's really not a lily. It's an American lotus, has a, a yellowish flower, probably a little more yellow typically than you see here. Uh, it could be on the whiter side, but uh, this is a problem, uh, underlying problem in this case would be shallowness of the pond. Areas of a pond that are le less than three feet or so in depth are going to be very prime for um, emergent plants to take over the pond. So that may be an error in, uh, in how the pond was built. Uh, or it may be a pond that is filled in with sediment over time. So that's a, a serious underlying problem here that, uh, and by the time it gets to this point, goodness, uh, what are we gonna do about this? This is almost beyond the point of being able to practically treat and take a very patient person many years to go at this uh, with standard equipment to, to pray, uh, uh, spray and, and get this under control and they still have the underlying issue of shallowness. When, what is exactly is the area of your pond? Most people think of their pond as being the pool of water, the basin of water. But uh, there is a much bigger part of the pond that we need to think about, especially it's important for, uh, for pond managers, pond owners to be aware of and think about, and that is the area that drains down to the pond or the watershed. Um, here's the best photo I've been able to come up with of a watershed up uh, in o from Osage County, this blue stem uh, lake. Now, all these slopes are leading down there, so the way the things that are going on above the pond tend to end up in the pond, and this can be a problem for you. Uh, many people, uh, it's rare for a person to own all wide, so that means Pond owners are pretty much at the mercy of their neighbors, uh, but still it helps to know uh, what's going on and keep your eyes open for what's going on. These are probably uh, the most common threats in the watershed to your pond. Uh, the first would be areas of bare soil. Uh, off, uh, anytime there is construction, whether it's a, a road or a housing development, anything that has bare soil out there, that's going to cause sediment to come into your pond. It's going to lead to a muddy pond. So we want to do everything possible to prevent that from happening. Uh, Overgrazing would be similar. Uh, removing the protective plant cover by just uh, grazing down all the plants and you're going to have a pond that turns muddy and begins to fill up with sediment. Another common problem would be livestock waste, whether it's a corral or a manure pile. Uh, it, that leads to problems. We want to try to uh, rearrange things so that uh, those areas are not draining down into our ponds or the excess fertility is going to be a problem. Uh, in town, ponds suffer oftentimes, very commonly, that the, the ponds, especially in the more expensive neighborhoods, suffer from the runoff of chemical fertilizers. Uh, the phosphorus in those fertilizers draw, fuels the growth of aquatic plants, in particular algae. And my fourth bullet is, is kind of an interesting counterintuitive one. Uh, a threat in the watershed to your pond would be another pond higher up in the watershed. 
if that pond has undesirable fish species in it, because when those ponds overflow, fish have a trick of uh, moving overland. They'll sometimes go with the flow and you will end up with whatever undesirable species, whether it's mud cats or common carp or any number of other uh, species that cause problems in ponds. So that's something to scope out and realize if you want to have a really good fishing pond, you should probably all take into account the fact that, you know, are there any ponds above you? Uh, before I work, spend lots of money and time and effort to get my fish population just the right way, shouldn't I, uh, I, I realize I'm gonna be spinning my wheels if I'm at the mercy of somebody else's pond that's, that has mudcats in it, for instance. Livestock watering is uh, livestock watering ponds. That, that's probably the reason why m the majority of our ponds in the state were built. So we need to talk about that somewhat and uh, how uh, what's going on. This is uh, my example of a not so well managed livestock pond. Now, uh, if you're entirely utilitarian and you're saying, "Well, I just built the pond in order to water my livestock. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care." about uh, the uh, fishing, um, I understand that, and that's, that's perfectly fine. The problem is if we have cattle in here, they're doing a couple of things. Uh, if they're in there in excessive numbers, uh, they're gonna be shortening the life of your pond by uh, trampling the banks down and uh, leading to sloughing off, and that sort of thing. But even perhaps of more concern to livestock producers, uh, you're getting a lot of uh, animal waste deposited in the pond. And this seems to be, in my opinion, the number one problem that uh, uh, leads a pond to, more, to be more likely perhaps to having a toxic algal bloom would be high nutrient levels. So, and it's not just a matter of uh, toxic algae. That's still going to be rare even in high nutrient ponds but just the, the overall suitability of the water for consumption by livestock. Uh, are you getting your, if you have this kind of situation, are you, are you testing your, uh, are you doing livestock watering tests? Uh, it, the, 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 if, a long time before the, the cows refused to, refused to drink the water, uh, they may be drinking less water and less water consumption during hot summers means less gain. So, um, Managing the pond uh, to prevent that is something that it should be considered ahead of time. Sometimes uh, we talk about uh, uh, ponds are essential for, uh, or our ponds are seen as being important for the cooling of livestock. Uh, my preference would be to have some shade trees around uh, as, your, as a cooling source so that the, that pond is not the only place that they can cool off. One option, it's not a blanket recommendation for everybody. It depends on your situation. It depends on your circumstances, your preferences. But uh, one option would be to fence the pond off and just allow access at one point. And we can provide more information on that if you want. But uh, you'd have to armor that point with uh, probably some geotextile and then some gravel on top of it. Um, so it's a little bit more expense, a little bit more money. But uh, this is one way to prevent cattle waiting, assuming that you got some shade for those cattle elsewhere. Talking about ponds as a structure, and, uh, and there are uh, things in the pond uh, like dams and spillways and such that, are, that need us to be monitoring them. We need to have watchful, understanding eyes for how, pond, how the pond structures work so we can notice any pro early problems. This is a pond that I used to drive past regularly and it always uh, uh, worried me. And I don't know if you share my worry and what you're looking at here, it's not the cattle in the pond. My worry is, the, uh, is a matter of the the dam there and, and that we see on the far side of the pond, it's eroding badly. Uh, it could be that the cattle have uh, been walking along that dam and have removed all the, and have just led to sloughing off, but it's uh, actively eroding there. Another thing that I worry about with this pond is it looks like we've got some trees growing on the dam. That's an issue. Uh, those roots are, are loosening up the compacted soil of the dam and they can 
that can lead to the formation of little, tiny little uh, passageways where water begins to trickle and then those passageways can erode more and more. So uh, dams don't take care of themselves. We need to keep an eye on them and understand how to protect them. Here's a, a cross section of a dam that shows uh, not only some trees growing on it, but also some uh, beaver activity in there. Beaver will get into dams. Uh, also, you may not see them uh, unless you're really watchful, but it's, it, it, you need to be uh, looking for signs of beaver like uh, a disturbance of vegetation. Uh, beaver are always on the move. They're looking for new territory and your pond is probably uh, it looks very desirable to them. So they, they like the slopes on the uh, dams. They will burrow underwater and, and uh, dig upwards and make a, make a chamber there. And that chamber can potentially collapse. And, and that could lead to a very bad situation. That could lead to overtopping. If the, if the water begins to flow across that area, you're going to lose your dam. Uh, or it could be that some tree roots would intersect with some, uh, some burrows and uh, water would begin to trickle through that, that passageway. The tree dies or falls over, and uh, all of a sudden you've got water squirting out of the face of your dam. I've had one call like that. That's, that's not what you would want to experience. That's very hard to, to fix once things, uh, things can become pretty catastrophic in short order when, it, when water starts to flow over a dam or through a, a, a hole in the, in the dam. Uh, that water flowing through uh, those little passageways, uh, the engineers call that piping. Um, and here's an example of a pond, uh, of a pond that's not going to, a dam that's not going to be there very long. At, uh, uh, we don't know the exact story on this, but uh, you need to make efforts to, to not have to see this situation because there's not a fix that's uh, probably going to work. It's going to be a roll of the dice whether you can save this or not. On the top, we have a, a diagram of uh, a, a well-designed dam. Notice that it has uh, a, a, pretty, a pretty wide top. Well, it's, really, if I could draw this over or get the artist to draw this over, I would put an even wider top on there. The wider the top, the, the safer the dam is from that sort of failure. But it's got gentle slopes, and uh, it's, it, everything is different than the bad example at the bottom, where the, the slopes are very steep, and the dam itself is narrow, the top is narrow. These kinds of dams are very vulnerable to failure. Um, so. Uh, the more your, your dam looks like the, the bottom one than the top one, the more, the more you need to keep an eye on it. How do you keep an eye on a pond? Well, I would encourage everybody to get out several times a year and walk the faces of the dam. Uh, and so here, you, it, depending on the, whether it's a small dam and a mild slope, a zigzag up and down, or if it's a really big dam or a steep slope, you might need to make several passes back and forth. But you, if your dam is like most dams, you can't really just stand on top and see what's going on. You need to get down there and look closer. There's uh, things growing on it, uh, vegetation is growing on it, you can't see. So you get, a, get out there, if you see something suspicious, flag that location so you can find it later. Maybe take a picture, get together with your uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service pond uh, technicians, get their input. Uh, some photos of that would be useful. <clears throat> Ponds uh, will have a primary spillway typically. That's usually a pipe on the inside of the pond or at the first point where water overflows, but they'll also have an auxiliary spillway, what used to be called an emergency spillway. It's this flat area down there in the foreground here of the picture, this flat channel, so that uh, when the primary spillway can't handle it anymore, the secondary spillway or the auxiliary spillway begins to overflow. This is an example of an auxiliary spillway that has a problem. Um, if you can look up there uh, beyond the pond, you can see kind of a little trail leading into it. That's a, a heavy uh, uh, livestock trail. The livestock are coming, they've gotten into the habit of moving uh, along that trail and across the top of the dam, and then, <clears throat> and then they're walking uh, uh, on the spillway itself. The spillway should be 
vegetated with grasses, but there's nothing there. There's not a blade of grass. There's just about 10,000 hoof prints. And so it's bare soil. So every time that auxiliary spillway functions, every time it overflows, we're beginning to see erosion. And erosion starts at the outside outside of the spillway where the arrow is. Uh, what we see there is the, the very early beginning of a head cut. That's a bad deal. Head cuts will uh, in, turn into something like this, like here's a spillway that's uh, been neglected for over time. Uh, people kept procrastinating and the gully just kept getting bigger and bigger until now it looks like we're talking about some serious efforts to get in there with uh, road, loads of, of riprap or uh, concrete broken up or something. Uh, but again, I wouldn't do anything on my own. I would, I would consult with the uh, NRCS folks about what might be best. But above all, catch it early like it was in the previous slide. And it's pretty easy to fix. And you just divert those cattle away from that area. So the, get some sod, uh, 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 turf grass reestablished and, uh, and, uh, and stop that head cut early. So, but in all areas of pond management, procrastination is the issue. And uh, so here we see that somebody who's been procrastinating about their weeds and that this will definitely happen. So please don't let that uh, be your situation, get after things early, especially plants. Uh, now is the time of year, the springtime is ideal for, uh, for uh, doing, using some herbicides or taking some other steps. Oftentimes in the spring, people uh, are thinking about, uh, who are interested in, in angling, thinking they seem to automatically think about uh, stocking some fingerlings. I wanna discourage you from that because uh, fingerling stocking uh, generally just ends up being hors d'oeuvres for uh, the bass. Uh, there are better ways to manage, uh, I mean, that's not a good way at all. Uh, typically, if, if you want to improve the fishing, we need to begin by uh, looking at all the species there to make sure we don't have any problem species. And then we, uh, such as what we see here, the mudcats, the, uh, the green sunfish, which pe yes, people like to catch, people like to eat, but they are uh, in direct competition against the young bass. They are very prolific and they can get out of hand. So that's, a, that's an issue for us, the, the green sunfish there on the left. And uh, my toughest sale is to convince you that crappie, as, as wonderful a fish as they are, really should not be in your pond. It's very difficult uh, in almost all cases after a few years to keep, it's very difficult to keep their reproduction under control. They over reproduce in ponds because we just, uh, typically cannot keep enough of a hungry bass population there of the right size and number to keep their numbers cropped down. And if we don't have effective predation by the bass, the crappie are good at this, they get out of control and you end up with not a great crappie pond, but a stunted crappie pond, lots and lots of small starved crappie. So uh, I'll try to avoid these problem fish if at all, or if you do have them, then we need to visit about uh, ways to, to see about uh, that you might approach it to try to lessen the numbers or eliminate them altogether. And, but the way to, to really manage a pond that does not have uh, a problem with uh, the wrong species being in it, suppose you've got your, your largemouth bass, you've got your bluegill, You've got uh, some channel cats, that's the recommended, uh, generally recommended mix. You, the way to manage it uh, for good fishing is to regulate the harvest. You do, need, do indeed need to take out some of the larger fish, the larger uh, largemouth bass. But in general, in order to maintain the balance between the predator and the prey, between the bass and the bluegill, we want to see you harvesting uh, a few of uh, uh, bass that are 18 inches or over every year. We want you to, uh, we recommend that you return every 12 to 18 inch bass back to the pond. That's where you can do your catch and release to good effect. But that you also not just be an exclusive bass angler, but you also harvest um, <clears throat> about 50 bass, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 50 and under bass, uh, uh, per year, but also the bluegill as well. 
And uh, in general, if people do these things, then their pond stays in balance and you're catching quality fish and the pond does not uh, get overrun by stunted fish because of the balance issue. So uh, management pays. It takes a little bit of understanding. It takes some time. I encourage people to spend lots of time at their pond as uh, many of us you, maybe things, you know, one benefit of this current situation is people are spending more time at their ponds. There may be more time outdoors instead of being in a hurry to go here and there. You're, we're at home oftentimes more often. And uh, so we can uh, get down to the pond and enjoy it more. And uh, with some understanding, we can, uh, we can manage it better to avoid problems rather than dealing with them after the fact. So there's lots of information. Um, and I will, uh, your extension office can certainly guide you, but also online facts.okstate.edu can do a search for uh, most any topic on pond management through the search window. And you can also go to pods. The old fashioned way of accessing our lines is still up. Those are, are the, the quality of the fact sheet there is a little nicer. It's a little, uh, the, the photos are a little nicer and bigger than they are on facts.okstate.edu. Uh, I'd also uh, toot my horn here and, and uh, promote my Facebook page. Do a search for Managing Oklahoma Ponds, and uh, you will see uh, some current information about uh, pond management there. Uh, with that, uh, I, I'm just uh, I'm just looking here at, at about half of the fact sheets that we have on ponds, and I just uh, put this here at the end to remind me to, to be able to look there. But um, uh, I hope I haven't spoken too quickly with you. <laughs> uh, but uh, I am uh, going to be open to any questions you have. I hope you do have questions. Thank you, Dr. Beam. Um, <clears throat> there were, uh, uh, were not not any uh, questions <clears throat> put into the chat, um, but um, I will open it up to, uh, um, to, uh, to questions from the audience um, <clears throat> before we go. Uh, if you would like to, uh, uh, to be heard, then uh, you can unmute uh, your microphone, or there should be a a hand. Uh, depending on which type of platform you're using, you can um, virtually raise your hand, uh, and then I'll unmute your microphone <clears throat> to do that. And uh, uh, we can do that until uh, everyone is. Uh, uh, <clears throat> until everyone is uh, uh, done. Is there a place where we can find contact for our county extension office? Yes. Uh, so if you go to um, um, I'll try to pull it up here. Uh, so a place where you can find contact info that, um, I'll share this, uh, screen here with you. Um, it's extension.okstate.edu, uh, is what, uh, where you're going to go. And this is our new extension, extension, uh, web page and you can um, scroll down through here and uh, down at the bottom it says find your county office right here click on that link and then click on your county so that web address is extension.okstate.edu uh, forward slash county hey brandon Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, after you clicked off the OSU extension website, he went to a PowerPoint so nobody saw after the original homepage. Oh, 
No, I share the I shared the wrong screen. Here we go. How about that? You see the map? Yes. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so that's extension.okstate.edu forward slash county. Uh, and then you just simply click on your county and that'll give you the contact information for your county. Okay, that worked a little better. So uh, let's see here. Uh, um, Brian has a question. Any ways to selectively reduce grasses, weeds from certain areas to fish? Yes. Um, I think probably what you're Excuse me. What you're talking about is uh, 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 shoreline areas of the shoreline uh, to open those up for casting. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, usually what works in that situation is a spot application of the herbicide. So we need to get the the, uh, the plant that you're having a problem with identified. Send us a photo, like we talked about at the beginning, and we can probably come up with an herbicide that you could put out in that area. Uh, just to take out, uh, just to open up uh, one or two or three areas of your shoreline for you to be able to, to cast from there. That's the most practical way I'm aware of. There may be, there may be some more exotic ways. Some people might put down a blanket of, uh, or a, a, a pond liner or something. Uh, some, in some areas you can put down a, a pond liner or some thick heavy plastic. Um, but if you do that on top of the plants, once they're already growing, uh, you're going to have to weight it down because gases will develop. And so generally, it's, it's, it, what's done is, is spot application with a, the right herbicide for that plant. Okay, the next question, um, how to clear up a muddy pond? All right. Uh, the muddy pond situation, very common. Uh, uh, I would first of all look at the watershed, try to get a feel for the, uh, what is, uh, what's going on in the entire area that drains to the pond. Do you have any county roads? Uh, county roads can be an issue because they are, um, uh, there's bare soil there. Um, do you have any, uh, cons any areas that are overgrazed or construction? Is there any active erosion anywhere? If we can't control that active erosion, we're going to constantly be getting new clay coming into the pond. Uh, so it's going to be a waste of time to try to clear it up. But uh, so that's uh, step one. Step two would be to get a jar of water from the pond and just sit it on the shelf for a week and see if uh, it settles out or not. If after a week it has settled a significant amount, that tells us that uh, something is keeping the, the sediment in the pond stirred up right inside the pond. It could be wind action. In that case, is there anything we can do to reduce the wind action on the pond, like maybe planting a row of trees? Uh, or it, it, if it's not wind action, it might be a common carp or uh, some other bottom feeding fish. Maybe we need to, to have a strategy to get rid of that bottom feeding fish that's stirring the bottom. But if your sample uh, in the jar does not clear up, uh, that and, you, and you've, can, you've got all the problems in the watershed under control or you don't have any problems in the, in the watershed with active erosion, then we can look at uh, putting something, experimenting by putting something in the pond to try to cause that clay uh, turbidity to settle out. And usually what most people uh, respond positively to that they have on hand would be some old hay, some uh, hay that's several years old, that's uh, decaying, whatever. Uh, if you put that out, about two of the square bales per surface acre, uh, wait several weeks and then put out another two bales and do that maybe up to four or five times maximum. Uh, that may help you get that uh, clay turbidity settled out. But um, I hope some of those things might work for you in your situation. Uh, there are situations where it does nothing works, and we just have to go to something like a catfish only. Catfish do fine if they're being fed a little bit in that kind of a pond, um, but uh, 
Thanks for asking that question. It's a very, very common one, and I'm, I'm sure there's more people than you have that problem. Um, another question uh, that has to do with, with weed management, uh, and I guess the effectiveness of grass carp, uh, the concern of using too many herbicides or chemistries uh, in the water because it's used as a uh, for cattle watering. Right. Uh, I understand the concern. That's a, a, a reasonable concern. Uh, if um, we have some herbicides, we can't always do this, but in most cases we can find herbicides that uh, may be compatible with livestock. Uh, sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. So uh, some things are labeled that allow uh, livestock watering after a, a limited withdrawal time. There are a few things that have zero withdrawal time, uh, like copper sulfate, if that were to be effective in your situation for your plant. Um, but uh, grass carp sometimes work and sometimes don't work. Um, they uh, tend to have a preference. They will go for certain species of plants and not other species of plants unless they run out of what they prefer to eat. They also are prone to getting over the, uh, to escaping across spillways. So it's not a, a cure-all and you do have to be patient with the grass carp. It's gonna take two or three, at least two years for them to get up to size to where they're big enough to be having an effect. So sometimes we, we uh, think about an herbicide treatment in the short term and grass carp uh, at the same time to try to get them, uh, have them going for a longer term effect. Um, so again, it depends on, um, on the plant, they're gonna go for a softer type of plant. They can't take out the tough plants. They can't take out cattails or something that's very tough and fibrous. They just don't, they don't have the teeth and the jaws to be able to, to do that. But we have a fact sheet on that. We have a fact sheet on all of these things <laughs> there. And, and I, if you don't, if you wanna just uh, do a search through facts.okstate.edu, chances are you can find it. But if you can't find it there, we can, we can try to direct you to the specific fact sheet also. Uh, but there is a little bit of guidance on grass carp. They're not cheap. Um, and uh, we've also got guidance in, uh, I think it's 9206 on common pond problems that talks about uh, how to settle out muddy ponds or, or try to settle out muddy ponds. But Dr. Beam, I'm, I'm putting down here in the, uh, in the, uh, in the messaging, uh, some uh, some links to to uh, uh, fact sheets that you've uh, shared uh, and mentioned, and uh, I was just going to show everybody what um, the uh, can everybody see the this is what pods looks like. So this is our. Uh, uh, Pod stands for print on demand, but it's our fact sheet uh, clearinghouse. So you just go to uh, pods.dasnar.okstate.edu, and best thing, best way to do is is uh, type pods or um, your search query into the search box, and uh, and then you can you can find uh, um, all of these. Here's a frequently asked pond question. They're all in a nice PDF format so that you can print those out and, and save those and easily go through those. Uh, so uh, that's a really good resource uh, for you to have as well. Um, of course, you can get in touch with your county extension educator um, and um, they can give you information that's specific to your county. Um, uh, utilizing these resources as some background material um, and some framework to help you identify uh, 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 help you uh, uh, answer your uh, your specific issues so uh, a, a viewer is asking uh, I have a plant that is called pond weed. How do you get rid of it? Yeah, um, 
crazy name for a plant. Yeah, I always wonder who, who came up with that name. And I'm talking about the, the most non-descriptive name in the world, pondweed. Uh, those are the Potomagetans. Uh, and uh, there are different species of pondweed, but we all pretty much manage them the same way. Uh, uh, they don't cause problems for everybody. So first I would ask, you know, do you have, you know, how much of your pond is covered up by this, by this plant? Uh, we might want to, it wouldn't hurt to get a, send us a photo, but uh, uh, so we can be sure that we're talking about the same plant. But um, uh, if, it's, if it's only 20%, that may not be a problem. Uh, but if it's 100%, I would ask, you know, is your pond too shallow? Uh, this is, uh, that, how, what's the average depth of the pond? Um, and so if it's, if it's on the shallow side, we may have a recurring problem with it, with something wanting to grow there, whether it's pond weed or something else. But uh, the herbicide that uh, we most often consider would be uh, reward uh, in this situation uh, in terms of being cost effective. Um, and uh, so, but, but like everything else, uh, there are uh, some uh, withdrawal times. And uh, one of the peculiarities, so we'd want to uh, look those up for, uh, for what your pond uses are, like livestock watering and see how long that is. And, uh, but th the peculiarity of reward is you have to uh, not muddy up the water. So you can't wait around with a sprayer and stir up the bottom because that inactivates the herbicide. But um, most people have fairly good luck with reward as a, again, herbicides are a short to medium term measure. Uh, it, ponds tend to, uh, plants tend to grow back. So it's not a permanent thing, but uh, you might wanna take a look at that product. And Dr. Beam, I've, I have several questions throughout the year that, that do relate to grass carp specifically. Um, and um, is there a uh, 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 grass carp or are there other fish species that you, that you cannot use grass carp with uh, because of a matter of predation? Uh, some people believe that uh, if you put grass carp in with bass, they'll eat all the bass or vice versa. So what's the, uh, what, what, what's going on there? Uh, grass carp don't har harm any other species, but they're very vulnerable to being eaten by bass. So if, like most people, you have bass, big bass in your pond, you're going to have to buy a, a larger grass carp to try to get them uh, to be able to escape from the from the bass so you, you need at least a 10 inch grass carp if you're stocking on top of bass <clears throat> okay is there a um, does osu or, or do you uh have a uh, uh a, a specific um um I guess aquatic management or uh, or fisheries management uh, web page. In, for, in terms of managing the fish population. Well, just a just a general um, uh, page that's dedicated to uh, pond weed identification or, or you know some things like that. For, for pond weed identification, I think one of the best, we don't have a, a dedicated web page for that. Uh, something that I often uh, steer people towards is the Texas website. Uh, it's a great website for, uh, for having photos and drawings of a wide range of plants. The, the, the drawback is they have more problem species in Texas than we do here, so you may get a little bit misled. But uh, I do use aqua plant a lot. It's uh, aqua plant. A-Q-U-A plant, aquaplant.tamu.edu. But uh, uh, so if you want to do, go it alone, that's, that's one way to do it. But uh, I, I encourage people again to, uh, to get the benefit of some free advice and to send a, a good photo into your county extension office. Yeah, that's a really good resource. Um, I've used it uh, Quite a bit, especially as as an extension agent in Texas, um, it's uh, it is a really good resource. And um, um, that's uh, if I get a bad picture from somebody, then I usually turn to that first to to try to narrow it down, and then 
uh, and then hit the books. So, uh, um, so yeah, really good uh, resource there. Um, all right, um, I'm not seeing any other uh, any other uh, questions in the chat. I'm not uh, seeing any uh, anyone trying to gain access to a uh, microphone or um, raise their hand. Um, so uh, uh, I did, uh, I have put a, a one question poll on here. I'm just kind of playing around with, with uh, Zoom and uh, it does give us the ability to to uh, to get some information, and um, uh, so it's uh, basically, uh, did you like Zoom, um, and uh, did you like uh, uh, the content that we provided over Zoom? And um, uh, so I'm not sure how you see um, uh, how you saw that. I guess. Um, but um, I'm not sure how it showed up on your end, but it looks like everybody took it. Everybody looked like everybody liked it. It was anonymous. So if you would give us a bad review, I wouldn't be able to find you. Um, so um, I will share, yeah. Let me just copy and paste the, uh, the URL for, uh, for that. Um, uh, fisheries and aquaculture uh, management. And that, again, that's the aqua plant that Dr. Beam was, uh, that mentioned. Uh, so um, I'm going to uh, uh, save the chat. This uh, recording has been, uh, or this Zoom meeting has been recorded for, uh, uh, for posterity. It'll be cleaned up and it'll be put out to the world um, in uh, certain ways. So, um, I don't have anything else. Dr. Beam, do you have anything else? No, I uh, appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, we're always here. When you have a question, uh, get in touch with your county extension office. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. Enjoyed, uh, enjoyed uh, visiting with you today. Well, thanks, Dr. Beam. I think it went really well. Um, and uh, we'll probably uh, look at doing some more of these in the future. So everybody uh, stay safe and stay healthy if you need anything. Uh, call your extension office.